my friends, this is probably the worst light ever just because I have my car shade on because I'm just sitting in my work parking lot and I don't want to be broadcasting that I'm YouTubing in my car. But anyway, this is just a very quick intro because this video is going to be a bit of a strange one, honestly. I was planning on doing an entire vlog of my road trip through New England, but then halfway through I just didn't get enough footage for that. But I did want to share footage and then I also wanted to do some Robert Frost poetry analysis because being in just New England made me think of Robert Frost. And so this is going to be a mishmash of... Vermont footage, Robert Frost poems, and a Vermont haul. And yeah, just wanted to give that little intro before we start. This week was extremely chaotic and I wasn't going to post this week, but I really wanted to. And so hopefully you enjoy this mishmash of footage and just New Englandness. <laughs> This is my friend Jackie. Hello. We are going on a road trip through New England. First stop is Dartmouth, where mm -hmm. I can live amongst the academics and we can just walk around. And it's fall, so it's really pretty. So I thought I would take you all along with me on this little road trip, get footage, and we'll just see where it goes. But we're starting off in Dartmouth. That's where we are. I Maybe you can't tell that it's Dartmouth at all, but we're in Dartmouth. <laughs> I'm not lying. We're here. Yay, Dartmouth! Yes. <laughs> Hello again, I hope the light in this is good. I was filming another video right before this and all of a sudden the light just got really dark. It's like a very cloudy day, but I just wanted to hop on here very quickly and just do a mini, mini New England road trip haul. Pretty much just Vermont, I think actually. I don't think I got anything in New Hampshire, but I am just going to get into it because I did get two books, but I'm going to start with the non-bookish things. And that is first, Buttermilk Pancake Mix, which... I don't know, but I got it specifically because I got a teeny tiny bottle of Vermont maple syrup. And so I didn't have pancake mix. I didn't want to make pancake mix. And so here's the pancakes. Here's the syrup. Excited for that because here's my little bottle of Vermont maple syrup. I'm not that much of a syrup fan, but it's I was in Vermont. And so I guess that is what one does. And the next little thing that I got, which is my new favorite thing that I own, Perhaps it is this little bear and it is wearing a knitted sweater. 
that says I love Vermont on it. And I do love Vermont and I love this bear. And it's really cute. And my friend got the same one. So we have matching Vermont bears. And this is my new little desk friend. That is all about that. Now we are getting into the two books. The first one that I got, these were both from a library book sale in Woodstock, in the Woodstock Public Library. They were doing a little book sale and I found two books, which was exciting. The first one is just Wordsworth Selected Poetry. I've talked about Wordsworth before. One of my favorite poets, but the only um, like poems that I have of his in print are in one of my Norton anthologies. And I just really don't like reading the Norton anthologies because they are so huge. You can't take them anywhere. They are just heavy. They're cumbersome. I've tried to like read from them. And what ended up happening is I spilled like an entire cup of coffee on my anthology because it was just too bulky and it like knocked the cup over. But anyway, now I have this little Oxford edition of William Wordsworth Selected Poetry. Excited to perhaps read more of his poems because I haven't read too many, but he is a favorite. I have like really enjoyed all of the poems that I have read from him thus far. The next one that I got is the Portable Conrad revised edition. And this is just a Viking portable library edition. I don't know. It has like the penguin symbol too. So I don't know. I was just like drawn to this cover, first of all, and just like the design of it. I thought it was really cool, but also because it has a couple of works that I have not read. It has Typhoon and then Youth, The Secret Sharer, Six Short Stories, and then Letters, which I thought was really interesting. I'm always very excited when books contain like other material that aren't just the author's work, like letters or academic essays, etc. I find it's just helpful to have in my little library. And so I was mainly drawn by the letters, but also because this has works I have yet to own by Joseph Conrad. And so I'm just adding to my little Joseph Conrad library with this. And also because I just liked the design of this. I thought it was cool and I had never seen a Viking portable library edition before. So now I have one. But anyway, I believe that is it. I believe that's all. Oh, actually, I did get one other thing. The single honey straw that I ate already. So that was my Vermont haul. I wanted to get a t-shirt. They did not have my size. But these are the little items that I got. Especially excited about the books because I love library book sales. They are amazing. This one was no different. I have two good finds. But anyway, that is going to be it for this little update slash haul. And I will see you in the next one. to the Robert Frost poetry reading portion of this video. This is such just an interesting conglomerate of footage, I think. I don't even know how it's going to end up turning out. Let me know if you all enjoy having this mishmash of footage being put together, because I don't know, every time I do a trip or something, I want to vlog and then it doesn't end up turning out the way I want, but I really wanted to document this trip. And so I'm putting this out, but 
Let me know how you feel about it. I don't know, we'll see how the finished product comes out. But I was inspired by New England and I really wanted to read Robert Frost and I love doing poetry discussions on my channel and so I was like, okay, let's incorporate this. Now, he, this man wrote a lot of poems. I don't know which ones to read. Anytime I've read a poet, usually the professor gives me a list. He didn't have a professor to give me a list this time. So I'm going to start with the two ones that I know of off the bat because they're pretty famous, The Road Not Taken and Nothing Gold Can Stay. And then I'm just going to literally open it up to random pages and we'll see what we get. And I'll just do it until, I don't know, I'll just read poetry until I can't read anymore. So we'll start with The Road Not Taken. And so also, if you don't know, I didn't preface this, but usually the way I do poetry chats is I read the poem and then I basically just dissect it classroom style and so that's what I will be doing. Should have said that first but we are going to get to it now. The road not taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to see where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Okay, first initial comments. I think the ambiguity in this poem is actually quite interesting. I know this is a very famous poem, but I don't think I had actually read it all the way through until I picked this up very recently. I think I've only heard the last stanza, but I think it is very, very ambiguous. We start with a literal description of two roads. One is grassy, not worn, the other has been traveled on longer. And then the end, it sort of shifts and we can tell that this is being symbolic. The roads probably symbolize something other than physical roads. I shall be telling this with a sigh, some are ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. That's sort of, I think, what we cling to in popular culture, which makes sense because it is I think the star of the poem is that last stanza, but also it makes the rest of the poem more ambiguous and just applicable to life as opposed to just being about literal roads. The speaker is probably talking about a decision or a path in life, maybe many different things. And I think depending on what time of your life it is and what's weighing heavily on you in the moment, you can sort of project many different things onto this poem because it's ambiguous enough that it can do that. And so that is what I'm going to say about that. Pretty brief, I think I don't have as much to say as for some other poems. I will say Robert Frost is not a favorite poet based on what I've read, but I do admire his work. So we're doing this, but I'm not like as profusely gushing as I usually do. And maybe if you've seen my other poetry chats, you're like, wait, that's it. But that's it for now. So we are going to do Nothing Gold Can Stay, which is of course, The Outsiders, the famous one. This is the one I think, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is not the one that people know, but this is one of the ones that I think of when I think of Robert Frost. And so it's, nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. Can I just say that this is like, this is the most applicable poem. Well, not the most applicable poem because I don't know, I haven't read all of them, but just driving through New England, seeing all the beautiful golden leaves. And then now we are hitting winter. And so the leaves are starting to die and the trees are starting to become bare. And I really like how just brevity is emphasized in this. Nature's first green is gold, but it's her hardest hue to hold. And so that golden moment is fleeting. And then her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Again, really emphasizing the brevity and the passing nature of this. And then leaf subsides to leaf, and then Eden sank to grief. I just love the rhythm of this poem too. Dawn goes down to day. And then at the end, of course, the famous line, nothing gold can stay. And so this evokes to me a very vivid image of nature changing, the leaves changing. You have beautiful golden leaves in the fall, but then of course they die, nothing gold can stay. The brevity of these golden moments. It's a very brief poem, but 
I think it's really impactful and I sort of see why this is one of the more famous ones even though again I haven't read enough to really give a firm opinion on that but I really like this and I think this is sort of a comforting poem even though it is kind of somber that nothing gold can stay but I think it just is a little reminder to appreciate those golden moments because driving through the leaves in New England is only fleeting and it's winter now almost not yet not quite thank goodness but winter's coming nothing gold can stay but that is just a part of nature nature is cyclical dawn goes down to day the leaf subsides to leaf it, it does bring me like a sense of comfort i don't know i think it sort of makes me okay with the fact that good things are fleeting and just to treasure those moments now we're gonna get to the fun part just gonna this one ghost house I'm intrigued. I think this book knew that I was an Emily Dickinson fan, so I'm just going to read it. Ghost House. I dwell in a lonely house I know that vanished many a summer ago and left no trace but the cellar walls and a cellar in which the daylight falls and the purple-stemmed wild raspberries grow. O'er ruined fences, the grapevines shield, the woods come back to the mowing field. The orchid tree has grown one copse of new wood and old where the woodpecker chops. The footpath down to the well is healed. I dwell with a strangely aching heart in that vanished abode there far apart, on that disguised and forgotten road that has no dust back now for the toad. Night comes, the black bats tumble and dart, the whippoorwills come to shout, and hush and cluck and flutter about. I hear him begin far away enough, full many a time to say his say before he arrives to say it out. It is under the small, dim summer star. I know not who these mute folk are, who share the unlit place with me. Those stones out under the low limb tree doubtless bear names that the mosses mar. They are tireless folk, but slow and sad, though too close keeping our lass and lad, with none among them that ever sings, and yet in view of how many things, as sweet companions as might be had. So this one is interesting because when I read the title, I thought, okay, the house is going to be haunted, have ghosts in it, but actually, it is the house itself that is the ghost, it seems like, because I dwell in a lonely house I know that vanished. And so the house actually vanished and left no trace but the walls. And so the house itself is a ghost, which is very, very interesting. That was a sort of plot twist that I wasn't really expecting, that vanished abode there far apart on that disused and forgotten road. So I don't know, this poem could maybe be about nostalgia. I also don't like saying like what is a poem about. I sort of I feel like that kills the joy of just reading poetry and studying poetry because you can't give poems like a one word what is it about. So instead I'll sort of talk about the emotions it evokes in me and it sort of gives me a sense of nostalgia just of things lost. This house that they that the speaker once knew now it's vanished but now they're dwelling here and then we get to the stanza about what it seems to be a graveyard um these stones out under the low limb tree doubtless bear names of the mosses mar and then it actually the final stanza shifts to focus on these people they are tireless folk but slow and sad though too close keeping our lass and lad, with none among them that ever sings, and yet in view of how many things, as sweet companions as might be had. So this is actually, I don't know, it leaves me a sense of just loss and sadness and vanished things. The house itself is vanished, and then all these vanished lives, it sort of seems like we might be talking about a ghost town, but we're specifically focusing on a house, and then looking at these graves and this nostalgia over these people. It's not clear if the speaker knew these people, but there is that sense of nostalgia. This one I might actually like more than the famous ones, like The Road Not Taken. This one is very interesting to me just because it sort of subverted all my expectations about what I thought it would be when I read Ghost House. I thought it would be you know, spooky, haunted ghost house, maybe that's just me, with contemporary conceptions of what a ghost house is, but an actual vanished house, the house itself is the ghost. I wasn't expecting that turn, and I appreciated Robert Frost. And so let us go with our next random selection, because that one was successful. We're just gonna flip, open, a minor bird. Is this one long? No, okay. Because some of these are kind of actually long, and I'm like, oh no. So this one is a minor bird. 
I have wished a bird would fly away and not sing by my house all day. I clapped my hands at him from the door when it seemed as if I could bear no more. The fault must partly have been in me. The bird was not to blame for his key. And of course there must be something wrong in wanting to silence any song. Honestly, okay, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by this poem. This one might be my favorite. I like how I just was like, yeah, everyone, we're not getting real deep into the analysis because Robert Frost is not a favorite. Maybe I was just reading the wrong ones. I think we're getting lucky with our selections here. This is intriguing. I don't know what to make of it, honestly, because birds singing, of course, would conventionally be considered like a happy thing, happiness, and then being surrounded. But then the key is wrong. And so the bird was not to blame for his key, but it could actually not be wrong. It could just be that the speaker doesn't want to hear this right now. I don't know, my immediate reaction, and this is just an emotional response, this is not like an academic analysis or anything, especially when I read the last sign, and of course there must be something wrong with wanting to silence any song. It just sort of left the feeling in me. You know how maybe sometimes you're feeling down or you're not feeling the greatest, and I think there's this sort of pressure sometimes that you always have to be happy and chipper and you can't have bad days. And I think this is actually quite interesting. It's sort of maybe evoking that emotion that we're supposed to want to always have birds singing, but I want to silence this bird. I clap my hands at this bird, but there must be something wrong with that because why would anyone want to silence a song? That's just the emotion it evoked in me. Maybe that's a very personal response. I would be curious to know what your response in this is. I think it's also interesting that it's called a minor bird because it of course could be referring to a minor key, but then it also maybe could be referring to the fact that this bird is a little, little thing. It's a minor thing. It's obviously causing a problem for the speaker, but of course there must be something wrong for wanting to silence the song. And I think even it seemed as if I could bear no more. It's very extreme in that, that I can't bear this song anymore. It just seems very oppressive, this bird. It could just be a minor bird, but it feels oppressive in the way that it's written when it seemed as if I could bear it no more by the house all day. I like this one. That's the sort of response it evoked in me. Very short. I feel like it could be taken a lot of different ways, but that is my response to that one. Let's go for another one, shall we? I don't know how long we're like running at, but it's fine. We'll just flip and see what we get. Fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice, from what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Interesting. I actually don't quite know what to make of this. I think I would have to like, take my time and go line by line with this one because, ooh, this is like evocative. I don't know. I feel like such... I feel like I'm just becoming like some of my English professors where, I don't know, I'm just like getting so excited about it. And I feel like, I don't know if students, when they're like in the class and the professor's like, ooh, evocative, if that is, I don't know, maybe students would be rolling their eyes at me right now if I were in a classroom, but it is, isn't it? Isn't it evocative? It's just, there's a lot going on here. Some say the world will end in fire. Immediately, I think he's referring to religion religious connotations of the world ending in fire, some say in ice. And from what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire, which is interesting. I actually don't know how the Bible says that the world will end. I would actually need to brush up my knowledge on that because I'm unaware at this point. I don't know, I would need more context to be able to fully digest this poem, I think, because some say the world will end in fire. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. I don't know, because I, I feel like this poem is going in a religious direction. So I don't know the connotations of fire and ice and the world ending in religious context. I'd have to look into that before I said anything further because I'm just unaware at this point. If I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Again, the hate and the religious connotations and the fire and ice, I think 
I don't know, it, it's evoking a lot of reactions in me, but I think I would have to look into whether Robert Frost was trying to evoke religious connotations or if he's not doing that at all. And I would also have to look up fire and ice in religious context and what they mean and what they symbolize to be able to fully analyze this poem. But I'll just end by saying, I think it, this, this one, I'm flagging this because I actually would like to go back from it once I educate myself a little bit about the religious connotations of fire and ice and the world ending. Learning is a lifelong process, my friends. Let's do one more because that one was good. So now I'm excited. Let us flip. Let's try one from like the very end. I don't know. Let's try to get one from this back half. Into my own. Already intrigued by the title. One of my wishes is that those dark trees, so old and firm they scarcely show the breeze, were not as toward the merest mask of gloom, but stretched away unto the edge of doom. I should not be withheld, but that some day into their vastness I should steal away, fearless of ever finding open land or highway where the slow wheel pours the sand. I do not see why I should ever turn back, for those should not set forth upon my track to overtake me, who should miss me here and long to know if I still held them dear. They would not find me changed from him they knew, only more sure of all I thought was true. Okay, this one, another interesting one. Not, it didn't evoke as strong of a reaction in me as some of the other ones, as you probably can just tell by me literally stopping reading the other ones and like looking at you like the most excited academic you ever did see. But this one is also interesting. The speaker is actually saying that they don't want these dark, gloomy trees to just be the merest mask of doom, but stretched away unto the edge of doom. And the speaker is describing going into this like dark tree doom place, which is very interesting. It's not something that I would typically expect. I don't know, I thought of Robert Frost, I think nature poems, I don't think of him writing poems where it's like, I want these dark trees to stretch in the gloom and then I'm going to go into these dark trees. I don't know, maybe that's just me and my misconceptions about Robert Frost. I think the line, fearless of ever finding open land or highway where the slow wheel pours the sand. Because you would think, or I don't know, maybe I would think, you go into this forest with these dark trees, you're in this like sea of doom and gloom, you would want to find open land, but fear less of ever finding open land. And so it sort of implies that finding open land would be a fear, but in this doom and gloom, he's not going to find, it. the speaker's not going to find it. And that makes them fearless. And they're not going to find highways, which I guess, okay, I guess this does make sense because highways do sort of destroy forests and they destroy the natural habitat of trees and so I think the idea of just having like a vast expanse of trees that is not ruined by humans actually okay now this kind of makes sense that Robert Frost wrote this this sort of does match with my conceptions of who he is as a poet so it's starting to make sense you're going through this journey with me I think it's interesting that he says if people find him they would not find me changed from him they knew, only more sure of all I thought was true. And so the all I thought was true is sort of ambiguous. We don't know what the speaker holds to be true, but they obviously believe that this experience of going through this vast expanse of trees that is unmarred by highways would only solidify them in all their beliefs. And so I think we could sort of make guesses about what those beliefs are, but not really, because it's not really said in the poem. So this one is interesting too. I think I'm actually gonna stop there because I don't know how many we did, but I feel like that was a good amount. I feel like we got some exciting ones. We got some longer ones. We got some shorter poems. And so that is my Robert Frost flip through. Maybe I will read more Robert Frost in the future. I will say Robert Frost is the kind of poet that I sort of need to be in the mood for. The New England road trip put me in the mood for Robert Frost, but some of those were actually very captivating. So maybe I just need to read more Robert Frost before I could just throw out anything that's not Emily Dickinson, which honestly is what it sounds like I'm doing, but I'm not, I promise. It's just that, I don't know, certain poets, just every single poem I read, I'm like, wow, you know, this, this is it. Not so much with Robert Frost, but I did really like some. So it's a mixed bag. But anyway, now I'm just rambling about my personal feelings about Robert Frost. That is besides the point. I don't know the order of these, but if this is the final clip, 
Thank you so much for watching this mishmash of clips. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sticking with me this far, if you made it this far, and I will see you in the next video.